Okay, so let's uh, kick it off. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, the next thing is we ask for uh, protection against the accursed shaitan. So we say, "Audh billahi min ash-shaitan rajim." Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa taala states, "Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love, and whatever you spend, indeed Allah is knowing of it. All food was lawful to the children of Israel except what Israel, which is Jacob." had made unlawful to himself before the Torah was revealed. Say, O Muhammad, uh, so bring the Torah and recite it, if you should be truthful. And whoever invents about Allah untruth after that, then those are truly the wrongdoers. Say Allah has told the truth, so follow the religion of Abraham, inclining towards truth, and he was not of the polytheists. Indeed, the first house of worship established for mankind was that at Becca. Uh, which is another name for Mecca, blessed and guidance for the worlds. In it are clear signs, such as the standing place of Abraham, and whoever enters it, which is the Haram, shall be safe, and due to Allah from the people is a pilgrimage to the house. For whoever is able to find hereto a way, but whoever disbelieves or refuses, then indeed Allah is free from need of the worlds. So, Naturally, we have one of the foundational pillars, which is Hajj, and uh, it's obligatory for us to conduct the major pilgrimage at least once in our life. But there are um, concessions as well. So in case if you're sick, you know, you can have circumstances where you uh, pay somebody to go and conduct the Hajj for you. Uh, and it's a very good deed. And likewise, I know that there is a there is an authentic hadith in regards to a person who was saving up uh, uh, money to go and conduct Hajj, but um, his neighbor was stricken with poverty, and instead of going and uh, spending the money on Hajj, he uh, decided to donate the money over to his uh, neighbor, and uh, the angels when they uh, counted Hajj that year, um, they counted him as as one of the uh, people that have completed Hajj successfully because that was all of his wealth and he spent it fi sabilillah or for the sake of Allah. Say, O people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while Allah is witness over what you do? And again, this is a question and it's being posed to the people that are not believing. Say, O people of the scripture, why do you avert from the way of Allah those who believe seeking to make it seem deviant? while you are witness to the truth, and Allah is not unaware of what you do. O oh, you who have believed, if you obey a party of those who were given the scripture, they would turn, uh, they would turn you back after, you believe, after your belief to being unbelievers. So it goes on, to Allah, uh, and, and how could you disbelieve while to you, while to you are being recited the verses of Allah, and among you is his messenger, and whoever holds firmly to Allah has indeed been guided to a straight path. O you who have believed, fear Allah as he should be feared, and do not die except as Muslims, which is in a state of submission to him. And this is a very profound point, especially because uh, you have people that are uh, inquisitive, and they say, well, why doesn't God uh, talk to me in the manner that I want? Or why doesn't he represent himself or present himself in a manner that I want? Well, it would be very silly of the slave to be commanding the master. And likewise, you know, uh, for the people that wonder, why was I created? I didn't have a choice in all this. These are all questions that come up. Uh, it is also really silly because the table wouldn't ask the carpenter, why did you make me? Rather, it was just made. And now that you're here, it's important for you to connect to your creator because that's what we have been uh, commanded to do as a duty. Uh, and it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on. And hold firmly to the rope of Allah altogether and do not become divided. And remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies. And he brought you, uh, he brought your hearts together and you became by his favor brothers. And you were on the edge of a pit of the fire, and he saved you from it. Thus does Allah make clear to you his verses that you may be guided. And there's another profound point here, especially about holding on tight to the rope of lost path and not becoming divided, because sectarianism is a very, very big deal. So when you have sects of Islam coming about and they say, oh, are you Sunni, are you Shia? 
It's Quran and Sunnah. This is the majority. This is what the Ahl of Sunnah wal Jama'ah, what the consensus is. You follow the majority based on the scholarly traditions as well as based on the prophetic traditions. The scholarly traditions are the prophetic traditions. When we have these types of deviations from the sect, such as what you see today in regards to uh, Qadianis, in regards to Shia, in regards to all these different sects, this is a clear violation of the Quran. Absolutely clear violation of the Quran. Uh, and let there, be, let there be arising from you a nation inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong, and those will be the successful. And this is the nation of the Muslims, right? So Muslims are supposed to be standing together, standing firm, and inviting and enjoining to good. Uh, and do not be like the ones who became divided and differed after the clear proofs had come to them, and those will have a great punishment. So we have an example of history. We have an example of the past. And the Quran warns us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us not to become like that. Uh, if you take a look at the majority of Christianity today, you'll see that there are so many different versions and so many different editions. Some of them have 66 books. Some of them have 72. Some of them have 68. And they're all holding to what they believe to be the truth. And uh, if somebody were to be looking at a hallway and they see a bunch of empty doors, and if you were to be exploring Christianity, uh, there's over uh, eight or 9,000 different um, sects or different divisions of different types of Christianity. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really warns us about uh, as, as far as um, standing firm and remaining strong and not becoming divided. On the day, some faces will turn white and some faces will turn black. As for those, uh, those whose faces turn black, to them it will be said, did you disbelieve, which is reject faith after your belief, then taste the punishment for what you used to reject. But as for those whose faces turn white, they will be within the mercy of Allah. They will abide therein eternally. These are the verses of Allah. We recite them to you, O Muhammad, in truth. And Allah wants no injustice to the worlds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us right now that he, he wants justice. He does not want any type of injustice to his creation. And in reference to faces turning black and turning white, um, this has nothing to do with race whatsoever. Rather, this is, uh, you know, the afterlife and um, our spiritual selves. We don't know what we're going to look like. We're, we're going to be an entirely, you know, in an entirely different form. But rather, this is the light emanating from the people that have elected the path of becoming Muslim and have gone through the trials in this world that have passed the trials. And likewise, uh, the people that have perpetually gone into disbelief um, the light will fade away from them, including their faces, right? Okay. Carrying on. Uh, to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Another healthy reminder. And to Allah will all matters be returned. So every single matter that's happening, no matter how big or small, is going to be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are the best nation produced as an example for mankind. Uh, you enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If only the people of the scripture had believed, it would have been better for them. Among them are believers, but most of them are defiantly disobedient. So here we have attestation that there are indeed people of the scripture that do believe and they are in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning uh, that you have people uh, both historically and in present time that are in a state of submission. Now, whether or not the, the message of Islam had reached them, that's an entirely different question. Um, but those people, if the message of Islam did not reach them, they would have a separate test on the Day of Judgment. And their test would be um, basically because of all the evidences and the proofs that they have, they would be told uh, to, st to step into the fire and the fire would be cool. Uh, and if uh, they didn't pass that test with all the evidences and seeing all the angels, seeing everything happening on the Day of Judgment and so on, then uh, they would they would uh, receive a just punishment. We have no inclination or no idea of how many people this is uh, or how many of them will pass their test. But I'm assuming that after seeing everything, probably a, a grand majority would, would pass the test. Uh, they will not harm you except for some annoyance. And if they fight you, they will show you their backs, which is to retreat. Then they will, uh, then they will not be aided. 
they have been put under humiliation by a law wherever they are overtaken except for a rope, which is a covenant from a law, and, an, and a rope or a treaty from the people. Uh, for example, the Muslims. So there was ropes uh, by the these uh, analogous terms um, and these metaphoric terms. There are uh, treaties and covenants that were made uh, between Jews, Christians, and Muslims way back in the day, and they have drawn upon themselves anger from Allah and have been put under a destitution. That is because they disbelieve or reject the verses of Allah and killed the prophets without right. That is because they disobeyed and habitually transgressed. So you see that it's not just about doing something one time, but rather it's a perpetual state of disbelief. It's a perpetual state of transgression, and it's a perpetual state of firing up those characteristics of um, the things that would lead you away from righteousness and lead you away from, from disbelief. You'll see that the Quran, you know, subhanAllah, it reinforces certain themes, and it may seem a little bit repetitive at times, but it's because certain points need to be stressed so often uh, because the very state of man is, is forgetful. So they need to be constantly reminded of what happened and they need to be constantly reminded of, the, of themselves, including their own position uh, with their, with their ever-changing ebbs and flows of life. Uh, they are not all the same. Among the people of the scripture is a community standing in obedience, reciting the verses of Allah during periods of the night and prostrating in prayer. They believe in Allah and the last day, and they enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and hasten to good deeds, and those are among the righteous. And whoever uh, and whatever good they do, never will it be denied, uh, never will it be denied them, and never will it be denied them, and Allah is knowing of the righteous. So again, uh, if you're if you're conducting good deeds and if you're making the correct steps, um, if you were to be denied any form of good, then it would be a form of uh, injustice, right? And we believe in a in a just, all powerful God. Indeed, those who disbelieve never will their wealth or their or their children avail them against the law at all. And those are the companions of the fire; they will abide therein eternally. So a lot of people think that just because they're rich or successful or something to that extent, they're immune. Um, and I had mentioned last time, you know, the quest for modern medicine. If you really dig deep enough, it's kind of a quest for immortality. It's people trying to stay alive no matter what the circumstances are, even to the point where they're trying to cryogenically freeze themselves and hope that something happens in the future. But we know as believers that death uh, is inescapable. The uh, because uh, it, in the Quran it tells us that every living soul, every soul will taste death. The example uh, of what they spend in this worldly life is like that of a wind containing frost, which strikes the harvest of a people who have wronged themselves or sinned and destroys it. And Allah has not wronged them, but they have wronged themselves. So here's a key answer to a question of why is there such atrocities in the world? Why are things taken away? Why is there trial, tribulation, and so on? Uh, because mankind is indeed spreading that corruption by their own hands. So either they're participating in it uh, passively or they're participating, it, uh, participating in the corruption um, uh, non-passively or proactively or actively, right? So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if we were to follow his system, there wouldn't be any type of corruption. But because there's many people that are not following the system of Islam, uh, that they are indeed corrupting the world around us and uh, in so doing are causing the Muslims to suffer as well. O oh, you who have believed, do not take as intimates those other than yourselves, which is the believers, for they will not spare you any ruin. They wish you, you would have hardship. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths, and what their breasts conceal is greater. We have certainly made clear to you the signs, if you will use your reason. And this is really interesting, especially in light of what's going on today. So a lot of the political stuff that's happening and the atrocities that we're seeing around in the world, uh, this is a clear-cut answer that, you know, these people who we think that we're going to change their hearts, not a chance. Uh, rather, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that changes the heart. But again, he has conditions for changing the heart. And be mindful of what they tell you because uh, they will betray you uh, with their mouths. And uh, what's what's in their heart is, is worse, according to the Quran. Here you are loving them, but they are not loving you. While you believe in the scripture, all of it, 
And when they meet you, they say, we believe. But when they are alone, they bite their fingertips at you in rage. Say, die in your rage. Indeed, Allah is knowing of that, with, with, uh, of that within the breasts. If good touches you, it distresses them. But if harm strikes you, they rejoice in it. And if you are patient and fear Allah, and their plot, uh, fear Allah, their plot will not harm you at all. Indeed, Allah is encompassing of what they do. So this is a healthy reminder that uh, we're not the ones that are in control, and they're also not the ones that are in control. So when you see these superpowers of the world, and you have a sense of hopelessness, then you need to come back to the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that he is the one that is indeed in charge and he is the one that is indeed ultimately in control. And at times we have to be patient, but it doesn't mean that we don't we sit back and do nothing. We still have to go out there, voice ourselves, spread the truth, and then we make dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill in any gaps that we may have. Okay, and remember when you, O Muhammad, left your family in the morning to post the believers at their stations for the battle of Uhud. And Allah is hearing and knowing. When uh, two parties amongst among you were able uh, were about to lose courage, but Allah was their ally, and upon Allah the believers should rely. So once again, reinforcing what the, the little small insight that I had um, just a little earlier, and already uh, Allah and already had Allah given you victory at the battle of Badr, while you were weak, uh, which is few in number then fear Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. Remember when you said to the believers, it is not sufficient for you that your Lord should, uh, is it not sufficient for you that your Lord should reinforce you with 300, uh, 3,000 angels uh, sent down? And uh, this verse is a little bit profound, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. Uh, so if you ever come across a situation where there is a hadith rejector, so, so somebody that rejects a hadith as revelation, um, this is proof in the Quran that uh, what the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said was a form of revelation because there is no other source of this than in the Quran, meaning that he said something and it is now it was now also revealed in the Quran that he said something. So um, this is a, an incredibly strong, uh, almost, uh, uh, actually, it is an impervious argument to uh, any form of hadith rejection. So uh, we believe that hadith, the ones that are authentic, uh, not the inauthentic ones, but the authentic hadith, uh, which are the sayings and the teachings of the Prophet, uh, they are a form of uh, revelation. So uh, this is a... a, a one of the best arguments to have, but, um, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from uh, that type of evil because uh, those people need some serious guidance. Yes, if you remain patient and conscious of Allah and they, i.e. the enemy, come upon you attacking in rage, your Lord will reinforce you with 5,000 angels having marks of distinction. And Allah made it not accept as a sign of good tidings for you to reassure your hearts thereby. And victory is not except from Allah, the exalted in might, the wise, that he may uh, that he might cut down a section of the disbelievers or suppress them so that they turn back disappointed. Not for you, O Muhammad, but for Allah is the decision whether he should cut them down or forgive them or punish them, for indeed they are wrongdoers. So here we're reinforced with that uh, notion again. It's not up to us, but rather it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on what he wants to do. You know, some of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet Islam, did in fact accept Islam and they were sincere with their acceptance and they were elevated to some of the highest ranks, including, uh, 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 you know, the guarantee of paradise for some of them. OK, so it's up to Allah on whose heart he wants to change. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. So uh, another theme that I've noticed is that when you come across these uh, verses that have to deal with punishment, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really always ends it with uh, mercy. So even though that he tells you that he can punish you, when to me, the names of Allah that are used towards the end of the verse, which is uh, forgiving and merciful, right? This is a sign that he is more merciful than he is punishing. 
Okay. So you have to kind of really reflect on that stuff because um, it's important. It's important to know that we believe in a, in a merciful God rather than one of vengeance and punishment. Uh, so alhamdulillah for that. Uh, o you who have believed, do not consume usury doubled and multiplied, but fear a law that you may be successful. We did cover usury a little bit earlier. Uh, so in the, in the previous video, and fear the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers and obey Allah and the messenger that you may obtain mercy. And this verse 132 is linked to that 124. So in the event that, again, you think that for whatever reason that you're not, that you're, you know, Quran only, um, this is wrong because the Quran tells you to obey the messenger uh, because uh, there is a... Uh, you know, the messenger does not speak of himself. Rather, it, he speaks uh, uh, on as a as a um, um, a conduit for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and hasten to forgiveness uh, from. It says here, and hasten to forgiveness from your Lord and a garden uh, which is paradise, as wide as the heavens and the earth, prepared for the righteous. So uh, let me just very briefly here. Uh, prepared for the righteous, who spend in the cause of Allah during ease and hardship, and who restrain anger, and who pardon the people. And Allah loves the doers of good. And those who, they, when, they commit to, uh, when they commit an immorality or wrong themselves by transgression, remember Allah and seek forgiveness for their sins. And who can forgive sins except Allah? And who does not persist in what... And who and and who do not persist in what they have done while they know. So again, uh, another sign of mercy, and this is who we should aim to be because we are going to make mistakes, we are going to have faults, but it's having that reflection and remembering Allah subhanahu wa taala and knowing that that mercy is there for us to um, benefit from. Those their reward is forgiveness from their Lord and gardens beneath which rivers flow in paradise wherein they will abide eternally. And excellent is the reward of the righteous workers. And notice the term uh, workers there because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just going to take your word for it. Rather, he is going to, um, he's going to take uh, uh, your, effort, your intentions as well as the actions that you conduct. And by the way, there's various rewards. Uh, so if you have an intention to do something, uh, but for some reason you just weren't able to get to it, then you will be rewarded as if you did do it. Uh, if you have an intention to do something and you do do it, you'll be rewarded a multiple multiple times over because you had the intention plus you did uh, the action to do it and including all the leading actions to get there. So just know that that's the, uh, mercy, the mercy that you have. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, I think that the situation is fixed, right? Meaning like it's rigged and it's such a hard examination. But if you were to actually explore what the deal is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the covenant that you made with him, you'll come to find that um, the game is rigged in your favor. Because if you were to commit a mistake and you were to ask for repentance, it would transmit to a good deed. If you were to commit a mistake, it doesn't get written down right away. Rather, it gets written down when you go to sleep or when you end your day. Okay, but if you were to commit a good deed, the good the good deed based on intention gets written down right away. And then, if you were to conduct the actions of committing that good deed based on the intentions, that they get increased tenfold. Um, and then, if you were again ask for repentance for the bad deed, then that would be written down as a good deed and a subtraction as a, from the bad deed. So if you were to kind of take a look at a book of accounting, um, it, it almost looks as a double positive on the ledger. And alhamdulillah for that. Okay. Um, so it says, those, their reward is forgiveness from their Lord and gardens beneath which rivers flow in paradise, wherein they will abide eternally and excellent is the reward of the righteous workers. Similar situations as yours have passed on before you. So proceed throughout the earth and observe how uh, was the end of those who denied. So this is a, a warning, right? This is a warning. Look back and see what happened to the people. 
um, and a lost path that I has left the signs. This Quran is a clear statement to all the people and guidance and instructions for those conscious of Allah. So do not weaken and do not grieve, and you will be superior if you are true believers. If a, if a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. And these days of varying conditions, we alternate among the people so that Allah may make evident those who believe and may take to himself from among you martyrs. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. And that Allah... Uh, and that Allah may purify the believers through trials and destroy the disbelievers. So uh, as Muslims, we do believe that trials are a form of purification. So in the event that uh, for whatever reason you feel that, um, you know, you're going through a tough time, just know that this is indeed a form of purification from your Lord. And uh, that uh, will lead to alt opportunities for good deeds, and it will lead to um, opportunities to get closer and closer to uh, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or do you think that you will enter paradise while Allah has not yet made evident those of you who fight in his cause and made evident those who are steadfast? So here you go. You have the condition, right? You think this is just, you know, there's just a, a gimme, like you just get a free pass just because you say you believe? No, unfortunately not. You have to believe, plus you have to um, put in your best efforts uh, and make evident uh, of that steadfastness, right? Uh, and you had certainly wished for death, which is martyrdom, before you encountered it, and you have now seen it before you while you were looking on. Muhammad is not but a messenger. Uh, other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or be killed, would you turn back on your heels to unbelief? And this is a pretty profound question because a lot of people, they are under the impression that, um, uh, you know, there's some type of, uh, uh, I don't want to say divinity, but I want to say some type of like um, uh, a chain or, or a disconnect would have happened. But instead, we believe in an undying God. So therefore, even if his messenger were to pass away, uh, which we do believe that he did pass away in this world, that uh, our faith is not towards just the messenger, but it is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, right? Meaning that the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and where, who our true judge is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, and he who, who, and he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. And it is not possible for one to, to die except by permission of Allah at a decree determined and whoever desires the reward of the world, we will give him thereof. And whoever desires the reward of the hereafter, we will give him thereof, and we will reward the grateful. So there you have it, you know, pretty cut and dry. If there's people out there that are wanting the reward of this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up the doors for you, man. There's there's nothing, you know, that um, he's saying that, hey, you know what, not a, not a chance. You know, rather, uh, you should be cautious because if all these doors perpetually keep... Um, uh, opening up, then you'll you'll start thinking that you're doing all these good things, but you could be heading towards chaos, right? And this is where uh, this is where that sensitivity of being um, innocent is such a, a blessing, right? Especially when you think that you're younger. Uh, you know, when you're approaching something wrong, your gut tells you, "Oh man, I, I need to stay away from that, or I need to shield my eyes from that." but you become so desensitized over uh, time that you you begin to lose that sense of innocence. So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve that for us so that it can help us uh, navigate the uh, trial that we're in. Okay, uh, uh, carrying on. And how many a prophet fought in battle and with him fought many religious scholars, but they never lost assurance due to what afflicted them in the cause of Allah, nor did they weaken or submit, and Allah loves the steadfast. And their words were not but what they said, our Lord, forgive us our sins and the excess commit, uh, committed in our affairs and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So Allah gave them the reward of this world and the good reward of the hereafter, and Allah loves the doers of good.
O you who have believed, so talking to the people that have believed, if you obey those who disbelieve, they will turn you back on your heels, and you will then become losers. But Allah is your protector, and he is the best of helpers. We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve for what they have associated with a law of which he had not sent down any authority. And their refuge will be the fire and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. And Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you when you were killing them, which is the enemy, by his permission until the time when you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order given by the Prophet and disobeyed after he had shown you that which you love. Among you are some who desire this world, and among you are some who desire the hereafter. Then he turned you back uh, from them defeated, that he might test you, and he has already forgiven you, and Allah is the possessor of bounty uh, for the believers. And this is in, in uh, specific reference to a war, a battle, in which um, the archers, I believe, or the back flank was ordered to uh, stay put. But um, they disobeyed the order of the prophet and they went and saw an opportunity to collect some of the bounty from, uh, the, um, from the folks that have passed away during the war. And uh, because they did that, they ended up losing the battle. So uh, having that type of mentality where you're you know, going out and disobeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and, and his messenger, it's going to result into that. So uh, let me read a little bit about what the tafsir says, because I think that it can provide a little bit more depth uh, than just my um, uh, general explanation. So uh, here's what Asadi says. Uh, Allah did indeed fulfill his promise to you of help. He helped you against them until they began to flee and you started killing them. Then you caused trouble for yourselves and helped your enemy against you when you faltered and quarreled amongst yourself about the prophet's orders and thus ignored Allah's command to be united and not disagree, but you disagreed. Some said we should remain in our position where the prophets of Allah stationed us, but others said, why should we stay when the enemy has started to flee and there is no longer any danger? Thus you disobeyed the messenger and ignored his instructions after Allah had shown you that which you love, namely the putting to flight of your enemies. What is required of the one whom Allah blesses with that which he loves is greater than that which is required of others. And in this particular case, what was required was something specific. However, in general terms, what is required is obedience uh, to the command of Allah and his messenger, alayhi Among you are some that seek worldly gains. They are the ones who caused all this trouble and some that seek rewards in the hereafter. They are the ones who adhered to the instructions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and remained uh, where they had been ordered to stay. Then he made you flee from them. That is, after you did these things, Allah caused you to flee from them. The course of the events turned into the enemy's favor as a test and trial from Allah to you in order to distinguish between the believers and disbelievers, the obedient and the disobedient. And so that by means of this calamity, Allah might expiate for you that which you had brought about. Hence Allah said, but he forgave, for, he forgave you for Allah is most gracious to the believers. That is, he is the most gracious to them as he blessed them with Islam, guided them to his religion, forgave them their bad deeds, and made them steadfast at the time of calamity. By his grace towards the believers, he does not decree for them any good or any calamity, calamity, but it is ultimately good for them. If something good happens to them, they give thanks and he grants them the reward of those who are grateful. If something bad happens to them, they bear it with patience and he grants them reward of those who are patient. So a really beautiful explanation and a healthy reminder of uh, are the importance of being patient. Continue, continuing on, remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside to anyone while the messenger was calling you from behind. So Allah repaid you with, the dis with distress upon distress so you would not grieve for that which had escaped you of victory and spoils of war or for that which had befallen you of injury and death. And Allah is fully aware of what you do. Then after distress, he sent down upon you security in the form of drowsiness, overcoming a faction of you while another faction worried about themselves, thinking of Allah other than the truth. The thought of ignorance saying, 
And the thought of ignorance saying, is there anything for us to have done in this matter? Say, indeed, the matter belongs completely to Allah. They conceal within themselves what they will not reveal to you. They say, if there was anything we could have done in the matter, we, or some of us, uh, would not have been killed right here. Say, even if you had been inside your houses, those decreed to be killed would have come out to their deathbeds. It was so that Allah might test what is in your breasts and purify what is in your hearts. And Allah is knowing of that with, of that within your breasts. So obviously there's going to be times where we're going to have to be courageous and we're going to have to stand up for injustice. And that's going to be a form of a test. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that even if you, you think that you're safe uh, behind walls, behind the safety of your home, that's not necessarily the case, right? Uh, you are not safe by any means. If he decides to... Uh, if he decides to send death upon you, then so be it. You have no safety, no walls, no no um, barriers, no nothing. You cannot you cannot prevent uh, the decree of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Indeed, those of you who turned back on the day the two armies met at Uhud, it was Satan who caused them to slip because of some blame they had earned. But Allah has already forgiven them. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and forbearing. And again, just this constant forgiveness and forbearance, forgiveness and forbearance, uh, putting trials out for the sake of purification uh, because of this merciful God. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. O you who have believed, do not be like those who disbelieve and said about their brothers when they traveled through the land or went out to fight. If they had, if they had been with us, they would not have died or have been killed. So Allah makes them so Allah makes that misconception a regret within their hearts. And it is Allah who forgives life and causes death, and Allah is seeing of what you do. And if you are killed in the cause of Allah or die, then forgiveness from Allah and mercy are better than whatever they accumulate in this world. This is a healthy reminder to um, be mindful of the akhirah rather than this dunya. Carrying on. And whether you die or are killed unto Allah, you will be you will be gathered so by mercy from allah o muhammad you were lenient with them and if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart they would have disbanded from about you so pardon them and ask forgiveness uh, for them and consult them in the matter and when you have decided then rely upon allah indeed allah loves those who rely upon him and here we get a glimpse into the Prophet Ali's character, right? He was not harsh in heart uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you had been, right? If you had been harsh at heart um, and if you had been unlenient. So we know that he's lenient and we know that he, he was uh, beautiful at heart. Uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If Allah should aid you, no one can overcome you. But if he should forsake you, who is there that can aid you after him? And uh, again, that's something to consider no matter what your affairs are. And upon Allah, let the believers rely. It is not attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully in regards to war booty. And whoever betrays taking unlawfully will come with what he took on the day of resurrection. Then will every soul be fully compensated for what it earned and they will not be wronged. So is, is one who pursues the pleasure of Allah like the one who brings upon himself the anger of Allah and who, whose refuge is hell? And wretched is the destination. They, they are varying degrees in the sight of Allah, and Allah is seeing of whatever they do. Certainly did Allah confer great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book, which is the Quran and wisdom. Although they had been uh, before in manifest error, why is it that when a single disaster struck you on the day of Uhud, although you had struck the enemy in the battle of Badr, with one twice as great, you said, from where is this? Say it is from yourselves due to your sins. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. And one of my takeaways with this stuff is um, naturally we can conduct good deeds to shield ourselves for any oncoming calamities. And if we're stuck in a um, perpetual sin, if we're keeping uh, this notion of being bad people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to keep sending calamities our way. So this is this is the issue. 
Uh, and a great way to shield yourself is making du'a and uh, uh, seeking istighfar, which is forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And what struck you on the day the two armies met at Uhud was by permission of Allah that he might make evident the true believers. So again, it was a test. And that he might make evident those who are hypocrites. For it was said to them, come fight in the way of Allah, or at least defend. They said, if we had known there would be battle, we would have followed you. So if they had known that there was a battle, they would have followed him. They were nearer to disbelief that day than to faith, saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts. And Allah is most knowing of what they conceal. So they conceal the truth within uh, their hearts. Those who said about their brothers while sitting at home, if they had obeyed us, they would not have been killed. Say then prevent death from yourself if you should be truthful. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging those people that think that they could have prevented the deaths of their brothers uh, who had fallen in battle. However, um, he's saying he's challenging them. If you're, if you're truthful of that, then go ahead and pre prevent death at any time, right? Uh, which is not possible. And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive with their Lord receiving provisions. And obviously, this is not in this material realm, but it's in the, in the realm following suit, uh, which is barzakh, and then uh, carrying on from there. Rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of his bounty, and they receive good tidings about those to be martyred after them, who have not yet joined them that there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. They receive good tidings of favor from Allah and bounty and of the fact that Allah does not allow the reward of believers to be lost. Those believers who responded to Allah and the messenger after injury had struck them, for those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward. Meaning it takes a lot of courage to stand up in, adverse, in a face of adversity. Okay, and if you're going to stand up for justice, that there's going to be some type of repercussions in this world. And uh, consider that standing up for that justice uh, is, is far better in the eyes of Allah uh, and that it's an expiation of sins. Those to whom people, which is a hypocrite, said, indeed, the people have gathered against you, so fear them. But it merely increased them in faith. And they said, sufficient for us is Allah, and he is the best disposer of affairs. So they returned with favor from Allah and bounty, no harm having touched them, and they pursued the pleasures of Allah, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. That is only Satan who frightens you of his supporters. So fear them not, but fear me, if you are indeed believers. Now, a lot of people, they fear demonic forces and stuff like that. And what about the, what about the creator uh, that is in charge of absolutely everything? First and foremost, those same demonic forces are petrified of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can see that with Iblis's interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah uh, tells him to that he is a, a, a reject and he's going to um, basically get cast out. Iblis pleads with him. So if Satan had any type of command, any type of dominion, there wouldn't have been any type of pleading. Um, so just know that who's ultimately in charge. And do not be grieved, O Muhammad wasallam, by those who hasten into disbelief. Indeed, they will never harm Allah at all. Allah intends that he should give them no share in the hereafter, and for them is a great punishment. Meaning, uh, we're not instructed to break our back to convince people. We're, that's, that's, not, that's not the play here. Rather, we're reminded that just leave these people up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it because there's no compulsion in Islam. Indeed, those who purchase disbelief in exchange for faith, never will they harm Allah at all, and for them is a painful punishment. And let not those who disbelieve ever think that because we extend their time of enjoyment, it is better for them. We only extend it for them so that they may increase in sin, and for them is a humiliating punishment. Now, here's the scary part um, when I reflect on something like this. If somebody is in a state of perpetual sin and they feel like they're doing good, they're not aware that they're doing wrong. So if the doors just keep opening for these people and they don't, they're not upon guidance, they're literally destroying themselves without even knowing it. And that to me is a, it's a very, very scary thing. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Um, so that way that we know that we're upon truth and remain firm on it. But 
you know, if if God intended something for you, uh, meaning, let's say, for example, that, you know, you were in a state of disbelief and you were conducting all these actions, <laughs> you know, imagine the landscape being paved for you where it's just like a nice, easy road. It's a very scary thing, but you're sliding down the slide and you can't stop, right? Um, so really something to kind of reflect that and consider about. Allah would not leave the believers in that state. You are in presently until he separates the evil from the good. Nor would Allah reveal to you the unseen. But instead, Allah chooses of his messengers whom he wills. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Again, plural. And if you believe and fear him, then for you is a great reward. And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. And to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. And Allah of what you do is fully aware. Again, you're not stealing from anybody but uh, the, the master and the owner. So the master and the owner is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think that you're getting away with something, uh, negative, right? Allah has certainly heard the statement of those Jews who said, Indeed, Allah is poor, while we are rich. We will record what they said and their killing of the prophets without right, and will say, Taste the punishment of the burning fire. What is uh, for you what your and that is for you what your hands have put forth, and because Allah is not ever unjust to his servants. Now remember, um, it seems like there's a common thread here, which is a thread of consequence, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases people in disbelief should they choose disbelief. And he also increases them in punishment should they choose punishment. So based on their actions, they are electing and choosing punishment. And now all of a sudden, you know, when they come to the day of judgment and they kind of sit there stupefied and they wonder, oh, what? how did all this happen? He's going to tell them it's by your own hands. Uh, you chose this. They are those who said, indeed, Allah has taken our promise not to believe any messenger until he brings us an offering with which fire from heaven will consume. Say there have already come to you messengers before me with clear proofs and even that of which you speak. So why did you kill them if you should be truthful? So again, um, these people were not nice to the messengers. These people were not, you know, it wasn't like they just welcomed them with open arms and all that stuff. I mean, imagine a situation where you have um, kingship or you have um, you have a, uh, a, a rule based on religion, like a religious society, right? And there's a rule. And these, rule, these rulers are saying, you know, we got to protect the thing that we have. And we, we're not just going to let this guy come in here and take everything that we've got. Now, you can see that from a king mindset, right, especially with like Pharaoh when he ordered the killing of all of the uh, male children, right? He's trying to protect his dominion, but it didn't work. And same thing with these, um, with these uh, Jewish um, scholars and rabbis and lords that they knew what was going on. They knew the scripture, but they were trying to protect their dominion, right, by... Uh, basically annihilating these prophets. Then if they deny you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so were your messengers denied before you. Uh, you brought clear proofs and written ordinances and the enlightening scripture. Every soul will taste death. And here it is, the affirmation of the Quran. Every soul will taste death and you will only be given your full compensation on the day of resurrection. So he who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to paradise has attained his desire. And what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion? Okay, so if you're headed down to a path of, you know, uh, doing a bunch of bad stuff, you're only deluding yourself right? You're only deluding yourself. And this is, um, it's an enjoyment, right? To, to follow suit into your own desires and into your own pleasures. You will surely be tested in your possession and in yourselves and keynote in yourselves. Uh, that's why Islam is uh, such a beautiful way to have self mastery because the limitations are not set by you, but rather it's set by your creator. And you will surely hear from those who, who were given the scripture before you and from those who associate others with Allah much abuse. Okay, so these people are not going to be nice to Muslims. They are going to try to fight them tooth and nail. But if you are patient and fear Allah, indeed, that is the that is of matters worthy of resolve. carrying on 
and mention, O Muhammad, when Allah took a covenant from those who were given the scripture, saying, you must make it clear, which is explain it to the people and not conceal it. But they threw it away behind their backs and exchanged it for a small price. And wretched is that which they have purchased. Or wretched is that which they purchased. And never think that those who rejoice in what they have perpetuated, uh, and excuse me, and never think that those who rejoice in what they have perpetrated and like to be praised for what they did not do, never think them to be in safety from punishment, from the punishment, and for them is a painful punishment. Uh, so this is to all the charlatans, uh, fake preachers, all these people that think that they are some sort of prophets um, or that they're withholding some type of you know information and thinking that they're benefiting themselves. They're not. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and Allah is over all things competent. And notice the theme. It's always, if you think you're, you're joking anybody, you're not. I'm the all-knowing. I hold dominion. I am the most competent and the all-competent over all things. This is, the, you know, notice how the, the, thema the uh, thematics play into the text. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of the night and the day are signs for those of understanding. So if there's somebody that's studying the sciences, um, uh, particularly these types of sciences, uh, they can see signs. Um, now, I'm not one that's you know, studying these sciences, but there are certainly sciences in this, right? And signs, uh, there are signs in this, and then there's sciences that support those signs to show the majesty of uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who remember Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides and give thought to creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishment of the fire. And this is so true, you guys. I mean, um, if you were just to reflect and think that there is nothing on this planet, uh, even in this universe, that does not have a purpose. At the bare minimum, if it has a purpose of beauty, it still has a purpose. Okay. Um, because, you know, you'll hear some really weird arguments from people. Okay. I'm talking very, very, very strange things. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a gentleman probably close to four days ago and he, you know, uh, but like, forgive me for saying this. He said, why is it that uh, men have nipples? Okay. The, the purpose is beauty. It doesn't have to have some type of like a function of feeding, uh, like uh, a female, uh, you know, body part does. Okay, but there is a purpose, right? Our Lord, indeed, whoever you admit to the fire, you have disgraced him. And for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. Uh, saying, uh, excuse me, our Lord, indeed, you have heard a caller. Uh, our, our Lord, indeed, you have heard a caller, which is Prophet Muhammad, salam, calling to faith, saying, believe in your Lord, and we believe our Lord. So forgive us our sins and remove for us our misdeeds and cause us to die among the righteous. And notice that this is a pattern amongst prophets. These uh, these messengers, salam, they have the best dua. So, you know, when you come across something like this, bookmark it and uh, remember it as a dua. Uh, which is a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Lord, and grant us what you promised us through your messengers, and do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection. Indeed, you do not fail in your promise. Okay. And their Lord responded to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded uh, to them. Never will I allow to be lost the work of any worker among you, whether male or female. You are of one another. So those who emigrate or were evicted from their homes or were harmed in my case, in my cause or fought or were killed, I will surely remove from them their misdeeds. And I will surely admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow as reward from Allah. And Allah has with him the best reward. So seek that best reward. Why would you settle for anything second best? Uh, be not deceived by the uninhabited. Uh, be not be not deceived by the uninhibited movement of the disbelievers throughout the land. It is but a small enjoyment. Then their final refuge is hell, and wretched is that is the resting place. But those who fear their Lord will have gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally herein as accommodation from Allah. And that which is Allah, uh, that which is with Allah, is best for the righteous. Again, that, that theme of righteousness. And indeed, among the people of the scripture are those who believe in Allah and what was revealed to you and what was revealed to them, being humbly submissive to Allah. 
they do not exchange the verses of Allah for a small price. Those will have their reward with their Lord. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. And this is a beautiful thing because it affirmed, uh, it affirms a couple things to me. The first thing is that there were people that were upon faith, right? Um, and which was relevant to their time. And then um, if a new scripture came, there could have been a situation where they did not hear the new revelation. And if they did hear the new revelation, um, then they, they have accepted it, right? Uh, oh, you who have believed, persevere and endure and remain stationed and fear Allah that you may be successful. Beautiful. And uh, that concludes Surah Ali Imran. We're still continuing on with the fourth juz. So this is uh, Surah Nisa. And it starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is uh, in the name of uh, God, the most gracious and most merciful. O mankind, fear your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you ask one another and the wombs. Indeed, Allah is ever over you an observer. And give to the orphans their properties and do not substitute the defective of your own for the good of theirs. And do not consume their properties into your own. Indeed, that is, a, uh, is ever a great sin. And I have noticed that there is a common thread going on in regards to the respective orphans. And I think it's because these people are um, in the they are in the most need. They're in the most amounts of need. And if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of other women, two or three or four. And again, this is a limitation on marriage, but there's conditions. But if you fear that you will not be just, then marry only one or those your right hand possesses, which is the slaves. And this is a particular category of slaves. This is Milik and Yameen. And uh, we can explore what uh, Sadi says on this because I know that it's a uh, it's a hot button, like a hot topic. So let me see if I can uh, very quickly get us over to the tafsir, and we'll see if there's um, we'll see if we can get some type of additional information for that. Okay. Okay, so here's what Asadi says. So that is, if you fear that you will not be fair or just to female orphans who are under your guardianship and care, and you fear that you will not fulfill their rights because you do not feel attracted to them, then choose for, from among other women and marry other women who seem good to you. That is those whom you choose of women who are religiously committed, wealthy, beautiful, of good lineage, or good social standing, and other qualities that make them desirable for marriage. So choose as you see fit. Out of all these qualities, the best you can choose is the quality of religious commitment. As the Prophet ﷺ said, women may be married for four things, their wealth, their lineage, their beauty, and their religious commitment. Choose the one who is religiously committed. May your hands be rubbed with dust. That is, may you prosper. And that is from Bukhari and Muslim. This verse indicates that the man should find out about women he wants to marry. Indeed, it is permissible for him to look at the one he wants to marry so that he will choose one he thinks is suitable for him and he will, cert uh, he will be certain that he likes her. Then Allah states the number of women whom it is permissible to marry, two or three or four. That is, whoever wants to take two wives may do so. If he wants to take three or four, he may do so, but no more than that, according to scholarly consensus. That is because a man's desire may not be satisfied with just one wife, so it is permitted for him to take one after another until he reaches four, because four is enough for anyone, except in rare cases. And this is probably talking about um, sultanship, kingship, stuff like that. However, that is only permitted on condition that he is certain that he will be able to avoid injustice and mistreatment and is confident that he will be able to give them their rights. So here's, this, here's the condition. You can have more than one, but if you think that there's going to be any form of injustice or any form of mistreatment then, or you cannot provide them their rights, then you cannot have more than one. But if he fears that he will not be able to be fair and just in any way, key point any way, then he must limit it to one or to a slave women because he is not obliged to give equal shares to a slave woman. 
that, namely limiting it to one wife or to a slave woman, is more likely to keep you from committing an injustice that is being unfair to any of them. So you cannot be unfair to the slave woman. You cannot be unfair to the wife. This indicates that for a person to put himself in a situation in which he fears that he may be unjust or unfair or not carry out his duties, even if it is permissible in principle, it is not appropriate. Rather, he must err on the side of caution and protect his religious commitment because keeping his religious commitment intact is for the best. Because many men mistreat women and deny them their rights, especially the mahr, which is the dowry, uh, which is usually a large amount that is paid in one go. Therefore, the husband may find it difficult to give it to the wife. Here Allah commands and urges men to give wives their dowry or mahr graciously, that is, with goodwill and with peace of mind, and not to delay it or deduct anything from it. This indicates that the mahr is to be given to the women if she has reached the age of accountability and that it becomes her property as soon as a marriage contract is done because it is described as belonging to the women there that is women's dowry, which implies that it is their property. But if they, of their own accord, choose to give it up, you up, uh, give up to you a part of it that is of the dowry, which is meant that if they give it up to you willingly and by their own choice by waiving part of it or accepting delays or substitutions, you may enjoy it with a clear conscience. That is, there is no blame on you for that, and there are no consequences. This indicates that the women, uh, that the woman has the right to dispose of her wealth even by giving it freely if she is mature. If she is not mature, then her husband, uh, or, excuse me, if she is not mature, then her giving it is not valid. We also learn that her guardian is not entitled to any part of her dowry unless she gives it willingly. Now, a couple things stand up uh, here. They, they come to my mind. So again, marriage in Islam is permissible um, at any age, but you can have, uh, you, you have restrictions on the consummation of marriage and there's conditions for the consummation of marriage, such as uh, physical maturity, mental maturity, um, agreements by both parties, uh, you know, there, there's all these conditions. And truth be told, if we were to use the Islamic standard of marriage, many people would not be married today uh, in this society because they're either immature or they're, you know, not in a position to be married. So what I believe is happening here is the dowry is if somebody is married, but they have a guardian that wants to keep that dowry, they do not have the, uh, that, that guardian, according to what Sadi says, uh, do not have, does not have the ability to give that dowry uh, or misuse it in any way. The words, you may marry other women who seem good to you, indicate that marriage to bad women is not enjoined. In fact, it is forbidden, such as polytheist women or immoral women. As Allah says, says elsewhere, do not marry polytheist women until they believe. And that's in Surah Al-Baqarah. We covered that earlier. And women who fornicate may only marry a man who fornicates or who is a polytheist. And that's in Surah Al-Nur, which is uh, chapter 24, which inshallah we'll get to. So um, he provided a beautiful explanation to that. Um, okay, so carrying on. And give the women upon marriage their bridal gifts graciously, but if they give up willingly to you anything of it, then take it in, sa in satisfaction and ease. And do not give the weak-minded your property, which Allah has made a means of sustenance for you, but provide for them with it and clothe them uh, and speak to them words of appropriate kindness and test the orphans in their ability until they reach marriageable age. Then if you perceive in them sound judgment, release their property to them and do not consume it excessively and quickly, anticipating that they will grow up. And whoever, when acting as guardian, is self-sufficient should refrain from taking a fee. And whoever is poor, let them let let him take accordingly to what is acceptable. Then uh, when you release their property to them, bring witness upon them and sufficient is Allah uh, as an accountant. So you may try to uh, swindle people out of what's rightfully theirs, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obviously keeping a watchful eye on things. And uh, naturally there is a severe punishment for that, especially when it comes to people that are um, orphans uh, if you were to misuse their property in any way. So there's a huge trust. There's an amana. There's a, a, uh, a big, big trust that is passed on to somebody who is a guardian. For men is a share of what the parents and close relative leave, and for women is a share of what the parents and close relative leaves, be it a little or much an obligatory share. 
And when other relatives and orphans and the needy are present at the time of division, then provide for them something out of it, which is the estate, and speak to them words of appropriate kindness. Because obviously um, they're going through a grievance. And let those executors and guardians fear injustice as, as they themselves had left weak offspring behind and feared for them. So let them fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. Indeed, those who devour the property of orphans unjustly are only consuming into their bellies fire, and they will be burned in a blaze, which is the hellfire. Allah instructs you concerning your children, which is the, their portion of inheritance, for the male what is equal to the share of two females, but if there are only daughters, two or more for them is two-thirds of one's estate. And if there is only one, for her is half. And for one's parents, to each one of them is a sixth of his estate if he left children. But if he had no children and the parents alone inherit from him, then for his mother is one third. And if he had brothers and or sisters, for his mother is a sixth. After any bequest he may have made or debt, your parents or your children, you know not which of them are nearest to you in benefit. These shares are an obligation imposed by Allah. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and wise. Now, obviously, there's an equation in here, and I would recommend uh, visiting scholarship to expunge a little bit more on this equation, especially because everybody's circumstance can be uh, so unique. So the idea is that when you tally everything up, there can be like odd amounts or there can be things where like debts come into play and then that changes the whole inheritance thing. Um, so uh, to my understanding, and again, consult scholarship, but to my understanding, everybody's supposed to be left with an equal playing field, but that does include the benefits and the debts. Meaning that if somebody has a tremendous more uh, amount of debt, depending on what they incurred the debt for, like let's say for example, if it was medical expenses or if they were a gambling addict, right? Those are all different varying situations. So that's why it's important to consult scholarship. Okay. All right. Um, continuing on. So, and for you is half of what your wives leave if they have no children, but if they have a child for you is one fourth of what they leave after any bequest they may have made or debt. And for them, i.e. the wives is one fourth if you leave no child, but if you leave a child, then for them is an eighth of what you leave after any bequest uh, you may have made or debt. Oh, okay. So there you go. And if a man or woman leaves neither uh, ascendants nor descendants, but has a brother or a sister, then for each of them is a sixth. But if they are more than two, they share a third. After any bequest which, has, uh, which was made or debt, as long as there is no detriment which is caused, this is an ordinance from Allah, and Allah is all-knowing and forbearing. So again, um, it, it is a complex issue and there's people that spend, you know, lifetimes studying up on this type of stuff. So definitely visit a scholar. But one of the uh, incredible things is that it is here. It is here in the Quran, right? So you have a standard that you're going to be held into account. You don't have to now go to some shady guy or some lawyer or something. Like that. No, it's in the Quran. So you, we, alhamdulillah, we have a standard and no book has this, by the way. Uh, and these are the limits set by Allah, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will be admitted by him to gardens in paradise under which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein. That is the great attainment. So again, after all of that, after all the wealth distribution and everything like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you of where the true uh, where the true prize is. Okay, which is attaining his uh, mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger and transgresses his limits, he will put him into the fire to abide eternally therein, and he will have a humiliating punishment. So back to the system of reward and punishment, right? The two major drivers of human beings. Either you, you get a cookie or you get in trouble, okay? Uh, those who commit immorality, i.e. unlawful sexual intercourse of your women, bring against them four witnesses from among you, and if they testify, confine them, which is the guilty women, to houses until death takes them, or Allah ordains for them another way. Now, here's the thing. Um, naturally, immorality of this kind is completely impermissible. And it is incredibly difficult to uh, bring about four witnesses, especially in the older days, because uh, you would actually have to see the act of penetration. 
But here's what I want you to consider. How is this applicable to today? If you, if pornography popped into your head, not only do you have more than four witnesses because the videos are on a broadcast, but you're actually physically seeing the penetration, okay, in these disgusting uh, events, and you actually know who the person is. You have a full biography of who the person is, and they're building a resume around it, okay? So it's very easy to testify against someone like that. All right, so really think about that for just a second. Okay, uh, and the two who commit it, which is unlawful sexual intercourse among you, punish, which is to dishonor them both. But if they repent and correct themselves, leave them alone. Indeed, Allah is ever accepting of uh, repentance and, merci and merciful. So if they're in a situation where they are for uh, regretful and they seek repentance and they want to fix themselves, alhamdulillah, the doors are always open. The doors are always open, okay, until uh, uh, naturally until the time of uh, when death claims somebody, right? The repentance accepted by Allah is only for those who do wrong in ignorance or carelessness and then repent soon after. It is those to whom Allah will turn in forgiveness and Allah is ever knowing and wise. So here's the deal. If you really are trying to better yourself, then alhamdulillah. But if you're just like, ah, you know what, don't worry about it. I'm going to go do whatever I need to do. And then I'll just pray and ask for forgiveness, you know, and I'll just keep perpetually doing that thing. But you're not actually trying to better yourself. Dude, come on. Man. You're just kidding yourself. OK, because we have people, especially I have people that reach out to me via email. They tell me very, very personal situations. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, bro, uh, you need to wake up like you really, really need to wake up. So it is. Uh, <laughs> You know, you're, you can't just be doing the same thing over and over again and be like, oh, yeah, you know, but I'm seeking forgiveness or you're fatwa fishing. You know, you're trying to look for scholars that, you know, somewhat lean towards your way. Forget it, dude. If it's going against Quran and Sunnah, no scholar is going to save you. There's no intercession. Okay. But repentance is not accepted of those who continue to do evil deeds up until when they, when death comes to one of them, he says, indeed, I have repented now or of those who die while they are disbelievers for them will be prepared a painful punishment. And there you have it. Not even, not even one verse after it literally tells you, Hey, you're not joking. Uh, you're not kidding anybody but yourself. Oh, you who have believed it is not lawful for you to inherit women by compulsion. Okay. You can't, you, you can't, <laughs> you can't inherit women by compulsion, period. Right. There has to be an agreement. And do not make difficulties for them in order to take back part of what you give them unless they commit a clear immorality, which is adultery, and uh, for example, adultery, and live with them in kindness. For if you dislike them, perhaps you dislike a thing that Allah uh, makes therein much good. Okay, you still got to treat them kindly, even if you dislike them. You still have to treat them kindly. You can't be, you know, this is a Islam. This is a Islam. You can't, you know, you can't mistreat people. And you, you, you most certainly, uh, and especially cannot mistreat women in Islam, period. Okay. But if you uh, want to replace one wife with another and you have given one of them a great amount in gifts, do not take back from it anything, meaning don't take anything back from the one that you gave gifts, uh, you gave gifts to. Would you take it in, in injustice and manifest sin, meaning you're stealing from somebody? You can't just give somebody a gift and be like, oh, well, it really wasn't a gift, so I'm going to need this back. I kept this tally, you know, this tit for tat kind of thing. Don't do that. It's ridiculous. Uh, and how could you take it while you have gone in onto each other and they have taken from you a solemn co covenant, which is a very, uh, you know, what's what's more what's more important? Somebody's uh, being intimate with somebody and having uh, something that you can never give back, you know, such as uh, purity uh, or having like little bars of gold, you know, come on, man. ridiculous. Um, and do not marry those women whom your fathers married, except what has uh, what has already occurred. Because obviously there was, uh, this is coming down at a time where there was uh, very strange things going on. Indeed, it was an immorality and hateful to Allah and was evil as a way. Okay, so there's uh, restrictions being set. Same thing with the marriage, by the way. The restriction of the, the four wives thing, that's a restriction. People used to marry as, as many and, and uh, many of them wouldn't even marry. They would just, you know, uh, perpetuate into, into greater and greater uh, misdeeds. 
Okay, prohibited to you for marriage are your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, your father's sisters, your mother's sisters, your brother's daughters, your sister's daughters, your milk mothers who nursed you, your sisters through nursing, your wives mothers and your stepdaughters under your guardianship, born of your wife uh, unto whom you have gone in. But if you have not gone in onto them, there is no sin upon you. And also prohibited are the wives of your sons who are from your own loins. And that you take in marriage two sisters. Okay, so you can't have two sisters um, simultaneously except for uh, what has already occurred. So you can't have two sisters simultaneously except for what has already occurred. Indeed, Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Okay. Clear-cut guidelines, guys. Clear-cut guidelines, and, and subhanAllah, no other book has this. Okay, uh, that is it for the fourth juz. So we have concluded it. Uh, beautiful. Well, that's it for the minute then. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. I'll chop it up. I mean, it'll be available, and I'll chop it up, add it over to the series, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid Allahumma barak ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi Muhammad kama barak ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you guys thank you so much and once again thank you Gandaria for the uh, donation alhamdulillah uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give you a, a piece of the da'wah, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I will be back tomorrow, inshallah.